von Gangnam Style. Gangnam Style. Hello everyone, um, welcome, I'm Zainab, I'm the treasurer of CSEF and we are the Cambridge Society for Economic Pluralism. We host, host talks and panels throughout term and we are very excited to have you all here and thank you all for coming once again. Uh, today CSEP is beyond excited to host Professor Ha Jun Chang. Uh, he is a South Korean economist who completed his PhD in Cambridge and continued to teach economics here for 32 years. He is now a professor at the Department of Economics in the SOAS University of London. He has published countless books, as you can see here as well, um, including the number one international bestseller, 23 Things You Don't Know About Capitalism. Alongside his academic career, he has advised many international organizations, including the UN and the World Bank. He is now here to give his insights on the topic of how to understand the changing world, economic megatrends, poly crisis, and geopolitical realignment. Uh, please save your questions to the Q&A at the end. And uh, without further ado, let's all welcome Professor Ha Jun Chang. Uh, yeah, so we'll yeah. do like 50 minutes of yeah. talk and then we can do mm -hmm. the Q&A. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, uh, welcome everyone for coming on this uh, rainy afternoon. The, uh, yeah, you can't avoid rain in this country, but uh, mm -hmm. I don't think we have many days when it uh, rains like morning till the evening uh, like today. So I'm very touched that uh, you guys all uh, made your way here. So, yeah, today I want to talk about, I mean, these big things, uh, you know, we are uh, supposed to be living in a uniquely crisis-ridden and rapidly changing time, you know, globalization and deglobalization, tectonic shifts in the geopolitics, mainly, but not exclusively due to the rise of China, new technologies of automation, including artificial intelligence, inflation, pandemic, war, climate change, and what have you. So you read newspapers, uh, listen to podcasts, you know, people are talking about poly crisis and uh, mega trends and you know, the tectonic shifts and so on. Well, this one thing that is happening that is unique to our time and of utmost importance, which is uh, ecological crisis. Yeah? I'm not just talking about global warming or climate change, yeah? because that, that, that's uh, not the only crisis that we are facing. Yeah? Because that, that there's a mass extinction of but, uh, many species. Yeah? acidification of the ocean, the depletion of uh, fish stock, and we are facing uh, the, the, a huge uh, the, the ecological crisis. But apart from that, I'm not sure whether we are living in such a unique period of time. Yeah? So, you know, pick a random period, you know, go back to the, say, 1970s, yeah? you had the Vietnam War, yeah? you had the, the associated wars in the Cambodia and Laos, yeah? you had the oil crisis, yeah? you had the death count the, the, between the, the US and China, you know, the, the, towards the end of the decade, the Soviet Union invaded the Afghanistan, you know, and there were that, uh, a lot of uh, like uh, left-wing revolutionary guerrilla movement uh, in Latin America and parts of Asia. You know, it's only because we have forgotten about this that, that, that we think uh, we are living in such a uniquely 
kind of uh, crisis uh, the lit ridden the, the period. Uh, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that what the things that I have mentioned, things that are going on, are not important or not happening. Yeah? All of these are happening. I think it's uh, the important that we understand the nature of this uh, phenomena correctly, because if you get, I mean, as Alan explained this uh, with uh, concrete examples uh, in the next uh, 40 minutes or so, but uh, if you get swept up by these uh, hypes, yeah, if you uh, 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 get kind of, uh, if you see the things that are from only one kind of perspective, then you are bound to get the, the things wrong and then yeah, you will take uh, wrong action. Yeah? Now, I don't have enough time to analyze any single phenomenon that I mentioned. I mean, each of them could consist of uh, that, uh, uh, would uh, provide enough material uh, to fill a whole hour's lecture. So I'm just uh, going to try to basically make a few suggestions as to how you look at these things. Yeah? I will use uh, concrete substantive examples, but uh, please do not think that uh, what I say about, say, automation or the, the uh, geopolitics or whatever is a comprehensive analysis. Yeah? I'm just uh, trying to make you see things a bit differently. Yeah? Okay, so first of all, when you read the things, hear things, you should check the point of view behind all the names, descriptions, and analysis of a phenomenon. Yeah? So for example, the, with the talk of poly crisis flooding the news media, you would think that the world was doing okay until recently. Huh? Okay, maybe things are starting to go wrong with the 2008 global financial crisis. Maybe it was uh, the, the, the doing sort of okay until the COVID uh, pandemic. Maybe the, the what really changed the world is uh, the Russia-Ukraine war, you know. But this view that we have somehow entered this uh, new era of overlapping crisis comes from a very particular point of view, namely the point of view of the Western world, especially the United States. You know? Yeah, so go and ask a Chinese or Indonesian businessman and ask them, but are you living in a crisis? Most of you will say, no, that we've uh, never had it so good. Yeah? No. I mean, of course, uh, these countries have serious uh, problems with you know, the inequality, environmental degradation, and so on. So I'm not saying that they have been yeah, uh, having a fantastic uh, time, but you know, for example, in the last 40 years, per capita income in China increased by 63 times. Yeah? I mean, Harold Macmillan in the 1950s, the British Prime Minister, told people that you've never had it so good. Yeah? I mean, that's what applies to China today. Yeah? So try to that, that persuade these people that you are living in a the holy crisis world, you know, they laugh at you. Yeah? In contrast, you go to certain parts of Africa or the Middle East and ask people how they are doing, They'll say, well, we've always lived in, I mean, I, they, they may not necessarily use the term, but we've always uh, lived in holy crisis as far as we can remember. Huh? More like a Palmer crisis. Huh? So this uh, characterization of our time as a uniquely crisis within time is not only kind of historically incorrect, because the, in the previous decades you had many similar periods, but also it's a very kind of uh, Eurocentric, if you like. Yeah? It's that even more than Eurocentric, it's that basically a lot of things are being said because the US is uh, feeling threatened 
about this uh, the, the, the supreme uh, status. Yeah? For another example, you know, these days is a lot of worry about robots and AI replacing humans. Yeah? I mean, several years ago, the, the Financial Times even the, came up with this app which uh, let you type in your profession and it will the, the, tell you what is the chance of your job being taken by a robot. Yeah? I mean, the people are talking about the need to introduce uh, basic income because of uh, the, the, the prospect of a uh, jobless society, you know, the, People are that, that talking about that, that having to regulate the AI or the automation that in order to you know, have social peace. Yeah, once again, the big changes, but when you think about it, the history of capitalism has been basically history of automation. Yeah? At least in the last 250 years, no, because that uh, fully automated processes uh, that, that, that started emerging only in the uh, late uh, 18th century. Yeah? So in the last uh, 200 years, you know, automation has destroyed billions of jobs, but more billions of jobs have been created. Yeah? Okay, I mean, there are societies where there are the huge un unemployment problem. Yes? Go to South Africa, I mean, there are official unemployment rate, unemployment rate is uh, between 30 and 35 percent. Yeah? So I'm not saying that uh, everyone uh, has a job. Uh, I'm not saying that all the jobs that uh, people have are decent jobs, yeah? with decent working conditions, decent pay. Yeah? But in the last 250 years of uh, automation, we have never created the kind of jobless society that uh, people are talking about. Mm -hmm. And also the, the, the saying that we haven't, uh, the, sorry, automation hasn't uh, created uh, job, uh, jobless uh, societies doesn't mean that we don't need to worry about these things, yeah? because that, uh, if uh, some people lose jobs uh, the, through automation, you know, their life is uh, destroyed. Yeah? I mean, this is why, at least in the, 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 the rich world that we have in the last that, uh, 100, 150 years, created a welfare state, yeah? including unemployment insurance, uh, income support, uh, created uh, uh, systems uh, where, well, I mean, uh, there are exceptions like uh, US uh, healthcare, but that, that, that people can have access uh, to basic services uh, that like uh, the, you know, education, the healthcare, water and so on. Yeah. But still, I mean, uh, once you lose your job uh, the, due to automation, then you, know, you need to be retrained, redeployed. Yeah. So that, that there are huge uh, challenges uh, with uh, the automation, but we are not uh, living in a unique time in terms of uh, automation. Yeah? This has always been the case. Yeah? So why is there such concern about the, the jobless world? Yeah? My interpretation is that it is basically because automation is uh, now affecting people who write about these things. Yeah? Economists, uh, journalists, yeah, or profession at uh, the, the, the jobs uh, that their partners or children or friends have, like uh, the you know lawyers, the uh, doctors, yeah. Because don't forget, these were exactly the same people only twenty years ago were criticizing the blue collar workers for wanting to stop automation. Yeah? You know, the argument was uh, that this is capitalism. Yeah? Are you against uh, progress? Yeah? Are you modern Luddites? Yeah? You, know, you have to accept this, take it on your chin, and move on. Yeah? Adapt or die. Yeah? 
Now that it's affecting white collar jobs, uh, they are suddenly, oh yeah, that, that it's a terrible thing to lose a job. Yeah? We need to that, that introduce basic income. Yeah? You know, I, I smell rank at the class uh, hypocrisy here. So basically, that these two examples show how you need to check from whose point of view these uh, phenomena are defined, described, and analyzed when you read yeah, whatever yeah, I mean, economics articles in the yeah, stuff on the financial newspapers, yeah, podcasts. Uh, because that, uh, all of these are not neutral things. Yeah? They are all defined, first of all, and the name, and then analyzed from very particular viewpoints. Yeah? I'm not saying that the currently dominant viewpoints are necessarily the wrong ones, yeah? but you have to know from which uh, viewpoint uh, these come from. Yeah? Okay, so that's the first point. The second suggestion is uh, that you should not be swayed by kind of fancy surface uh, phenomena and try to also the, the, the look at, if you like, more mundane but more solid uh, underlying reality. Yeah? I mean, this point is uh, very well illustrated by looking at the supposed the Second Cold War between China and the US. Yeah? This has uh, gained prominence, especially because the Americans are doing their best to prevent the Chinese from acquiring high-end semiconductor technologies, especially the ones uh, with implications for the military technologies, by you know, the putting pressure on Chinese or Korean firms uh, that, uh, not to sell the, the best chips uh, to China, build uh, factories in the US, you know, put the pressure on the Germans and the uh, Dutch uh, who make machines uh, that make uh, the semiconductors, yeah, not to sell these things uh, to the Chinese. Yeah. So now, I mean, there's uh, this uh, idea that, uh, that we have created or rather entered the era of Second Cold War. Yeah? But look more closely, you will realize that this is not what is going on. First of all, the Cold War, yeah? the, the confrontation between the Soviet bloc and the American bloc that, that uh, lasted between the late 40s and <clears throat> early 1990s. You know, during that, that, that period, the two blocs uh, didn't even trade with each other. Yeah? Okay, they bought and sold a few things here and there. Yeah? The, so when I first uh, came to this uh, country, uh, in the mid 1980s, the cheapest uh, car you could buy was uh, the, the Cold Yugo. Yeah? This was uh, kind of a very the outdated car the, from Yugoslavia. Yeah? So I'm not saying that there's no trade whatsoever. Yeah? That applied uh, probably only to North Korea, but uh, you know, there was uh, very little trade. Yeah? But today, the US is the second biggest trading partner of China after the EU. Yeah. China is the fourth largest uh, trading partner of the United States after EU, Canada and Mexico. Yeah. China accounts for 13% of US trade. Yeah. Can you sever that kind of relationship uh, overnight, yeah, even if you want it? Also, China's uh, export has played a key role in maintaining uh, the American the economic, uh, the, sorry, the political stability since the 1980s. Yeah? You know, until five, six years ago, the US median wage has been stagnant 
for 40 years now. Basically, U.S. median wage in real terms was stuck at the level of the mid-1970s until like uh, 2015 or thereabout. Yeah? How did the people survive? Partly because the, the, the they were kind of encouraged and even sometimes that the forced the, to borrow, so a household debt that the balloon, but also because there were all these cheap quality consumer products coming in from China. So can the US now say, okay, we are not going to import anything from China? So there will be a riot yeah, because the, the people will suddenly find uh, their living standard uh, plummeting. Yeah. So the, without uh, these uh, cheap imports from China, the US cannot uh, sustain its uh, the political stability. Yeah. The US uh, may want to push China out uh, from the supply chains that it relies upon, but it will take decades uh, of determined efforts to, to achieve this. Yeah? I mean, there's a lot of talk about uh, reshoring, yeah? so that basically the bringing back uh, manufacturing activities from China back to the US. Yeah? Neoshoring, yeah? uh, bringing it uh, to say Mexico or the, 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 you know, the Canada rather than the, the rely on the Chinese. Yeah? There's a lot of uh, talk of uh, French shoring. Yeah? So the, the Philippines might be quite far away, but it's uh, the, a good friend of the United States. So the, let's uh, the move uh, the production facilities uh, from China to the Philippines. Yeah? Okay, first of all, I'm not <laughs> sure whether you know, businesses uh, will necessarily comply with this uh, the foreign policy, yeah? because there's a reason why so many things are made in China. Yeah? It has uh, the, the, the high quality labor, given the price. Yeah? It has uh, the excellent infrastructure. Yeah? It has uh, the, the very high tech uh, capabilities considering the, the level of uh, income of the country, which is uh, just about uh, $10,000, yeah. they compete uh, the, the, the on equal footing in many areas, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, nanotechnology. Yeah. So the, the, there are reasons why the, all these uh, businesses are done in China. Yeah and trying to bring them back uh, will require a huge amount of uh, investment and the uh, uh, reorganization of uh, the American uh, political economy. Yeah? Because uh, in the last 30-40 uh, years of uh, globalization, basically the Americans and many European countries, including Britain, have destroyed the industrial base. Yeah? You cannot just uh, the, the bring these factories back, yeah? because uh, the, 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 these factories need workers with the right skills, yeah? the right kind of infrastructure. Yeah? Universities uh, that do research in the areas uh, where this, uh, the, the, university, uh, the companies work. Yeah? And many of these have been uh, destroyed. Yeah? So if you tell the private sector, okay, be patriotic, yeah? bring your uh, factory back, uh, they'll say, how? Yeah? We don't have, even have the workers that, uh, to hire. Yeah? How do you expect us that, that, to that bring the factory back? Yeah? This is why, despite all these talks of uh, you know, reshoring, friendshoring, uh, the, the, the US companies are still offshoring more than they are reshoring. Yeah? I'm not saying they cannot be done, but you know, it will take a long time because it has been, this uh, current uh, global supply system has been constructed over decades, yeah? involving huge amount of uh, industrial policy on the part of the Chinese government to make sure that, that, that it uh, creates uh, productive capabilities in all these industries that they want to develop. Yeah? 
And also another uh, important uh, thing to consider is uh, how the U.S. economy has been financialized in the sense that now the American the stock market is basically an automatic teller machine for shareholders rather than a mechanism to provide the corporate financing as you learn in textbooks. Eh? You know, the American economist uh, Bill Lazonic has done a series of uh, the excellent studies uh, showing how in the last uh, four decades, especially in the last uh, 25 years or so, American corporations have uh, completely changed uh, the way they do business. Yeah? So until the like, uh, 70s, American companies would I'm talking about uh, these big companies that are listed in the stock market. Yeah? American companies would uh, retain about half of its uh, profit. Yeah? And uh, give away the, the other half uh, to the shareholders at, uh, as dividends. Yeah? This was already higher than in countries like Japan and Germany, which is one reason why the US was uh, the, the finding it difficult to the fight off uh, the Japanese and the German challenges in the, not everywhere, but uh, in many areas, because the most important source of uh, corporate investment, financial source of corporate investment, is retained profit. Yeah? It's not freshly raised capital yeah, in the stock market. Yeah? So they used to retain half the profit, and in the last uh, 25, 30 years, the rate of retention has uh, fallen to 5%. Yeah? So in relative terms, they have only one-tenth of the money to invest. Because uh, the, this, the, the short-term shareholders have become very strong with the financial deregulation, opening of uh, alternative but, uh, financial markets abroad. Now, you know, they demand very high proportion of uh, profit to come back. So in addition to the dividends, now U.S. Uh, the corporations, Britain's very near this, do huge amount of uh, share buybacks, which is a practice where they companies uh, buy their own shares so that share price rises in order to allow the shareholders to cash in if they want. Yeah? And now a lot of American companies are, are doing uh, share buybacks more than what they earn in profit. Yeah? They borrow money to do share buybacks. Yeah? Because uh, this is what makes uh, shareholders happy and the uh, stock price is high. This is what makes uh, the, the CEO salaries uh, the high. Yeah? Because you have done well. Yeah? You have served your principal well by the, the giving away all these uh, the profits. But in the meantime, the company is hollowed out. Yeah? Now, when you have those kind of companies with very limited uh, resources for investment, can you expect them to have a renaissance of uh, manufacturing investment uh, in the US? No way. Yeah? It's not going to happen. Yeah, yeah also, I'm not saying that it will never happen. I mean, that if uh, the, the US has concerted industrial policy, reform of uh, corporate finance, yeah? It may be able to do it in the next uh, that, uh, 15 years, but you know, just that uh, having one or two industrial policy intervention in you know, clean energy, the microchips, that's not going to change anything. Right? And as, uh, as for the famous uh, the chips war, I think the Americans have uh, started too late. Yeah? If they wanted to uh, put China down, they should have uh, done this uh, 20 years ago, maybe 15. Yeah? Now China's uh, close enough uh, to be able to catch up. Yeah? You know, when the, the, the CHIPS Act was uh, introduced, the Americans thought, well, if we prevent uh, the Dutch and the Germans to sell these uh, the, the latest uh, the machines uh, to make uh, semiconductors, the Chinese are not going to be able to uh, make uh, the best chips. They've done it. You know, you know Huawei has uh, the, the produced this uh, new chip called the Kirin 9000S, which is uh, the, as good as uh, the, the anything that the Americans and the Chinese uh, can produce. Yeah? 
Of course, it uh, came at a high cost uh, because uh, they basically had to use the old machine, modify it, and uh, that do a lot of uh, that, uh, kind of, uh, that, if you like, uh, that, that, uh, innovation. And yeah, apparently the cost is very high. Yeah, but yeah, in between Huawei and this obscurely named the, the state-owned enterprise called SMIC, Semiconductor Manufacturing International Company. I mean, this is the most non-descript uh, company name that you, you can think of. Yeah? I think it's uh, deliberate. Yeah? They don't want uh, other people to know what uh, it's uh, trying to do. Anyway, so they've done it. Yeah? So, okay, maybe the, the next step uh, might be more difficult, but I think that uh, they'll do it. Eventually, yeah? maybe the Americans are actually accelerating uh, the China's catch up. Yeah, yeah the, the last but not least, uh, let's not forget that 13% of US Treasury bills are owned by the Chinese. Yeah? So, can you sever relationships uh, uh, with a country in a major way that, uh, that accounts for 13% of your trade? 30% owns 30% uh, of your government bond yeah? and provides huge proportion of uh, the, the consumer goods uh, the, that uh, your you know, electors uh, the need yeah? in a situation where you have already destroyed uh, what some economists call industrial commons, yeah? the workers, the research capabilities, the infrastructure. Yeah? I don't think so. Yeah? Yeah, so if you just uh, look at the chips war, I mean, it looks like, yes, uh, we are in the Second Cold War, yeah? There's a major the geopolitical realignment, but if you see it from the other side, this might be, yeah? Very, the, the, the ephemeral, yeah? Phenomenon, yeah? Another example that tells you that we shouldn't be swayed by the latest surface phenomenon is in the area of automation. Yeah, yeah automation is advancing, but A, it has always been advancing. Yeah? You don't see any acceleration. But uh, more importantly, the fact that something can be automated doesn't mean that it will be. Yeah? You know, like at, at, uh, in 2016, I think, yeah, there was a big newspaper coverage that Adidas, the German the trainers uh, the company, invented this uh, process uh, to automate the making of uh, trainers. Yeah? Great achievement because uh, the, you know, the, the shoes, uh, the trainers, uh, the, they have been manufactured in cheap labor countries that uh, well, to begin with, that uh, South Korea and Taiwan in the 1670s, yeah, mm -hmm. because that uh, it was actually that uh, quite difficult to automate the process. Yeah? But uh, Adidas invented this technology that requires no human hand uh, from beginning to finish. They even set up a uh, the, the couple of factories uh, in the U.S. and Germany, but. By 2020, these factories were quietly closed down. Yeah? Because, I mean, it's not a good thing, but that, that, that there's just too much cheap human labor in poor countries. Yeah? So technologically, this is possible, but it makes more business sense to produce that, that these trainers in China and increasingly lower wage countries uh, like Vietnam. Yeah? So we have to da, 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 look at things da, 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 da more deeply. Huh? I mean, da, da, the fact that something is new, looks fancy, you know, looks uh, technological advanced, that doesn't mean that it's uh, da, going to happen yeah? on any scale. Huh? Okay, the third suggestion regarding the understanding of our world is that you should never take anything as inevitable. 
because that, that this that, that this view that you know whatever is happening is happening because they have to in large part because these are consequences of technological progress you know? so you know they was a lot of concern about the rising inequality in the rich countries since the 1980s and 90s because in the, most of these countries inequality has uh, risen in the last uh, 30 40 years huh? and a lot of economists that uh, try to explain this with globalization and technological progress huh? So basically, the argument was uh, that the Harvard labor economist, uh, that uh, Richard uh, Freeman, put this uh, beautifully uh, already back in the 1990s. You know, he asked this question: Are your wages set in Beijing? Yeah. yeah so one argument was: Well, you have all this uh, that, 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 uh, downward pressure on the, the, the wages of. Uh, workers that uh, do not have these uh, very high skills because they now have to compete with uh, Chinese workers uh, who are paid uh, one-tenth of their wages. Yeah? It was also argued that uh, it's uh, the, the, the result of uh, technological progress. Yeah? So with uh, the automation, yeah, low-skilled workers are becoming less and less uh, necessary. So these are people who fall be, uh, behind, and this is why inequality is rising. Well, I mean, the, the logically fine arguments, but when you actually look at the data, you realize that actually there are countries where inequality has not risen. In France, the data is not kind of the, the, the comprehensive enough, but I think uh, there is uh, sufficient evidence to say that uh, inequality has actually slightly fallen in the last uh, three four decades. Huh? In the Switzerland, it has uh, stayed more or less the same for the last uh, three four decades. Huh? In Canada and in the Netherlands, it has risen, but only a little bit. Huh? Okay, then uh, you get to think that uh, okay, that uh, if uh, it was international trade that is uh, driving down the wages, why does it have a uh, little effect on smaller open economies like the Netherlands and Switzerland and Canada than large closed economies like the U.S. and Japan? Mm -hmm. You know, international trade account for only about 12, 13% of GDP of uh, the US and Japan. Mm -hmm. It accounts for 60% in the Netherlands. Yeah? Uh, sorry, the, the, not 60, the, the, the 40%. Yeah? So if any country should be affected by this uh, the, the globalization, international trade, or whatever you may call it, it should have been Switzerland and the Netherlands rather than the US or Japan in which uh, the inequality rose uh, the, the quite a lot in the last uh, few decades. Eh? So you can only conclude that uh, these countries have been able to contain the, the rise in inequality despite this, uh, the pressures of uh, globalization and technological progress because they use other policies to counter it, yeah? uh, sorry, counter them. Yeah, yeah and then that, that you have some evidence uh, to show that yeah? uh, you know, they, the, their welfare state uh, that became more redistributive, but uh, they seem to have uh, put more regulations on uh, certain markets that, uh, so that uh, markets that, that, that do not generate as much uh, the inequality as it uh, will that, uh, if uh, left uh, on their own. Go to the other end of uh, the income distribution, you have two famously unequal countries, 
with uh, similar levels of development South Africa and Brazil. You know? Indeed, that, uh, in the mid-1990s, they had almost identical levels of inequality. You know? Gini coefficient around 0 0.6. You know? But since the 2000s, Brazil, yeah, it had uh, lots of other problems, but at least I uh, had introduced this uh, the social welfare policies which uh, have uh, reduced uh, inequality quite a lot whereas uh, South Africa didn't do those things and uh, inequality is actually even higher than uh, during the days of apartheid yeah? because uh, now South African Gini coefficient is 0 0.63 instead of 0 0.6 whereas uh, Brazil has fallen from 0 0.6 to 0 0.5 yeah? Once again, you can do a lot to change these things. Yeah? For another example, in talking about jobless uh, society, people don't often realize that even if the new technology inevitably destroys more jobs than they create, a proposition that I highly contest, jobs can be, and indeed have been, created through government policies. Yeah? So if uh, government spending can be redirected uh, to increase the number of uh, healthcare workers yeah, in a country like uh, the Britain with uh, socialized healthcare, if the government regulation is revised to increase the number of nursery nurses per children, the number of carers uh, per resident in an old people's home, or the number of teachers per pupil in schools, a lot of uh, jobs can be created. No? And indeed, uh, many countries have uh, done this in the past uh, to create jobs. No? Anyway, so the, the point that I'm uh, trying to make is that, uh, the, you know, in describing a phenomenon as inevitable, as something that has to happen because it's uh, the result of, you know, uh, kind of uh, impersonal technological progress, impersonal market forces, we are actually accepting the status quo as something that shouldn't be changed or at least uh, cannot be changed. Yeah? But why are we doing this? Yeah? Because there are actual examples of countries being able to do something about these uh, things. Yeah? Okay, so I argue that you need to check the perspective that give you the definition and the name and the analysis of a phenomenon. <coughs> I argue that you shouldn't be swayed by all this uh, surface phenomenon and that uh, need to look at deeper underlying reality and I told you that you need to acknowledge the power of collective action including public policies all of these of course are not to say that the phenomena that worry people these days whether it's uh, the geopolitical tensions, automation, or globalization. I'm not saying that these things do not exist or that, that uh, they do not matter. Yeah? But you, in, in understanding these things, uh, you need to yeah, check the perspectives, go deeper, yeah? and then the, the, the be more willing to challenge uh, the status quo <laughs> and think about that uh, alternative yeah? and i'm not talking about you know world socialist revolution or you know the, the, you know, but the whole world uh, suddenly kind of uh, the, the listening to the greta thunberg you know we are, we are talking about the things that, that uh, many countries have uh, routinely done in the past yeah? some countries are still doing yeah? so yeah, I, I just that I wanted to uh, kind of uh, provoke you 
by saying that uh, many of these uh, the, the things that you think are unique to our time, you think that uh, cannot be changed, you think that uh, shouldn't be changed, that uh, they need to be looked at with uh, skeptical eyes and uh, the, with uh, the multiple the, the perspectives and with uh, the, the deeper understanding of uh, if you like uh, mundane reality. Okay, thank you. Um, so, first of all, you mentioned, despite its efforts, that U.S. can no longer really distance itself from China due to the interdependent nature of their economies. Um, so, looking at globalization more broadly and the interdependency of the global economy, would you say that this has weakened the functioning of international institutions dur during global crises for example, in the international response to Russia's invasion of Ukraine? Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, global institutions, global rules of the game, global organizations, yeah, these are highly kind of uh, politically biased in the sense that uh, they are basically controlled uh, by a handful of uh, rich countries. Yeah? So, you know, in the World Bank, in the International Monetary Fund, it's essentially one country, one vote. Yeah? Uh, sorry, one dollar, one vote. Yeah? So countries are given a little bit of share for being a member, but basically their voting rights are determined by the share of capital they have uh, paid in. Yeah? It's not exactly proportional because uh, there are even countries that haven't uh, paid in much will get something. But uh, essentially it's that uh, one dollar, one vote. Yeah? And yeah, to make it even more interesting, uh, all the major decisions require a super majority of 85%. And I'm sure it's a total coincidence, but uh, the US happens to own 17.8% of the shares. Yeah? So it uh, effectively has a veto power. Yeah? In the United Nations, it's uh, supposed to be one country, one vote, but the five members of the permanent, uh, the permanent members of the Security Council have veto. Yeah? The US, uh, UK, France, China, Russia. Yeah? In the WTO, it is a one country, one vote, uh, but uh, in the beginning, uh, the rich countries uh, the, did their best uh, not to have a vote uh, because uh, they know that they are going to lose. And now that uh, the, the developing countries have become more organized and uh, more aggressive, basically these rich countries, especially the US, have uh, disengaged uh, from the WTO. And yeah, even when the, 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 they are still members of the WTO, these countries are just uh, violating the rules uh, center left and right. Yeah? <coughs> because uh, the, they the, the think uh, they can get away with it. Yeah? So yes, I mean, the, 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 the original order is uh, highly you know, deficient. So, I think the rise of China and kind of uh, the certain financial institutions based in developing countries like uh, the Bank of the South or the, the CAF in Latin America, this has been a positive thing in the sense that it provides at least an alternative uh, to these institutions controlled by a group of uh, rich countries, yeah? because uh, the, uh, until these uh, the alternative uh, funding sources emerged, you know, basically there was only a town called the World Bank. Yeah? And if you didn't agree with the World Bank, you don't get a loan, yeah? as uh, simple as that. Yeah? <laughs> now there are alternative sources that the developing countries can play a bit of yeah? 
uh, bargaining game. But of course, that uh, you know, that, uh, when that, that, that this is not to say that you know, therefore these banks or the China they are necessarily better than the U.S. or European. Yeah? I mean, the, as a citizen of a country, South Korea, which has suffered uh, from bullying and invasion by the, everyone around us, you know. I still remember that the reading in one of our text, uh, school history textbooks uh, saying that uh, in 2100 or uh, there about the years of uh, recorded history, we were invaded something like 1450 times, yeah? almost yearly. Yeah? So I, I yeah, don't like uh, the, any, any country that, that, that being uh, too strong, but uh, you know, uh, the world order is uh, now in a different phase yeah, compared to what prevailed until even the, the, the 10 years ago, 20 years ago. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, the, the, it's uh, a time of uh, big shifts, uh, but we have to understand what these uh, shifts uh, really mean. Yeah. And it's not the Second Cold War. Yeah. The U.S. may want to win itself uh, off uh, the, uh, China, but it can't. Yeah? Then we have to think uh, that uh, what is uh, the best way to manage uh, this uh, potential conflict. Yeah? Anyway, let's leave it there. Yeah? Okay. Um, my second question will be regarding more so economic megatrends, especially in the developing world, as you mentioned. Um, so you stated that retained profits are now as low as 5% in the US and UK, uh, which then leads to less productive investment and to higher levels of inequality. So how do you think that governments can incentivize and initiate a shift in financial markets to favor productive reinvestment via retained profits? Yeah, I mean, they have to basically change the rules of the financial system. Eh? But of course, uh, the financial sector has uh, become so strong that uh, the you know, supposed uh, left-wing party in this country is uh, saying that it's uh, that, that going to abolish uh, the cap on the bankers' bonuses. Yeah? So you know that you have uh, the this situation that this uh, financial sector is uh, really eating uh, the, the real economy. And yeah, the, that's the, the why the, there are fewer and fewer, you know, stable, the, the, the well-paying jobs, that, the, which is that, the, what is uh, driving all this that, the, kind of uh, populist the, the politics. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, the, but the, without the reforming the financial system, you cannot the, the, the change this. Yeah. Because uh, the. When the shareholder the pressure is so much that uh, you have to basically give up uh, investing, then what are you going to fight yeah, the Chinese competition or Korean competition, the, the German competition with? Yeah? I mean, the, the, you cannot the, the fight the, the, this uh, competition in the real sector with the, the papers. Yeah? So, yeah, I mean, the, that's the first thing uh, that has to change. Yeah? Uh, I do want to keep on asking you questions, but then I don't want to take away much time from the audience as well. So we'll start to open the floor up for questions. So if you'd like to ask a question, please raise your hand and I will. Okay, there's uh, one yeah. at the back, yeah. Let me know if you can hear me. So you talk about the importance of applying the stimulus to things. And I'm not sure the validity of doing that is always justified. Um, for example, if it skills qualitative and quantitative differences in the nature of threats. So just for example, the um, white collar workers losing their jobs. So what we see is technological change. And then we see socio-political change trying to mop up that damage. But now we have an unprecedented rate of technological change, and we can probably all agree that the government is not much more efficient. So um, our ability to kind of mock that, that and work with that 
that's an important consideration. I think that's a lot from some of the models. If we, we, if we base our model on historical inferences, the other thing is that we haven't really, we haven't faced, apart from nuclear war, we haven't really faced uh, threats that, um, well, threaten the existence of not only our species, but all species like climate change and AI and the environmental problem there. So I think that's also um, significantly different. Um, yeah, so I basically question the validity of making inferences mm -hmm. solely through a historical lens. I mean, I understand that it's an important consideration <coughs> that has been left out, and we do need to challenge Eurocentric perspectives, because I know that's part of it too. But um, yeah, I think a lot of important information is also lost. And uh, so if you could talk about mm -hmm. um, potentially ways we could assess the validity of doing what you say we should do. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, well, first of all, you know, that uh, propositions like unprecedented uh, ways of uh, technological change, I'm not sure whether it's uh, true, yeah? Because uh, what that, uh, people often use in order to uh, measure the rates of uh, technological uh, progress is uh, pattern data. Yeah? But that uh, pattern data is uh, that, uh, partial, it doesn't reflect uh, all the technological changes. And also, that, uh, in the last uh, the two, three decades, uh, the world has changed in such a way that, that, that you have to pattern everything. Yeah? I mean, patterns uh, that didn't used to be that important. Yeah? So now you are that, that patenting everything. So that actually, having so many more patterns uh, doesn't necessarily actually mean that you are uh, that, that progressing uh, technologically uh, faster. Yeah? So that, that, that remains uh, that in doubt, but yeah, you are right. I mean, that, that, you know, that less drawing lessons uh, from history, drawing lessons uh, from other countries, they are always uh, limited. You know, that every country, every industry, every individual is uh, unique at some level. But what I would like to say is that, that despite that, that's uh, probably the best we can do, you know, because unless you are willing to do mass experiment uh, with the, the, the kind of live human beings, that's uh, the only the, the source of uh, the, the information we have. You know? Yeah, I mean, that, that we've done that, I mean, economists, uh, that, that we've done that, that too many experiments with uh, live human beings. You know? Soviet central planning, you know, that, that, that just uh, neoliberal revolution, you know, the Pinochet's uh, that, uh, Chicago economics, yeah? I'm against it, you know. So the, the short of uh, the, the, the kind of <laughs> instituting the, 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 kind of, uh, the regimes uh, that are willing to play with the uh, lives of uh, millions of people, I think uh, that the history and comparative uh, studies are the only things that, that, that we can rely on in terms of uh, drawing these references. Yeah? This doesn't mean that uh, the changes that are happening today are not uh, are kind of uh, the same with equivalent changes in the past. Yeah? But uh, what I have implied is that the difference is not as big as you think. Yeah? What I that, uh, would like to argue is that you know, that a lot of arguments are swayed by this uh, the, the surface phenomenon. Yeah? You know, even artificial intelligence, is that uh, such a new thing? Yeah? Because we have always uh, relied on the collective <coughs> intelligence. Yeah? Do you know how the, the, the cars are made? Do you know how the bus timetables are set? I don't know. I bet that you don't know. But uh, we use these things uh, because uh, we have basically uh, figured out a way to, uh, to uh, 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 create intelligence outside our brain. Yeah? That's artificial intelligence. Yeah? What is new is that uh, these have been embodied in machines. Yeah? So uh, you have to uh, uh, clearly separate what is new and what is not new. Yeah? So uh, yeah, I. I totally understand uh, your 
reservation about uh, drawing lessons uh, from history, but you know, a that's uh, probably the best that 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 source of lessons uh, the, that we have, and b you know that even accepting that that uh, we can only draw limited lessons, you know that whenever you are analyzing this that uh, uh, allegedly new phenomena, you have to really think uh, carefully before deciding what is new, what is really happening, what can happen, what will happen. Yeah? Um, anyone else? Yes, please. Uh, so, thank you for your sharing. My question is regarding the development of, of the, the currently poor countries. So we know that Japan and China develop based on being the factory for the world. However, automation also is a way that we can observe right now. So what do you see? Let's not talk about Vietnam or India that are coming up. Talk about African countries that are lagging even further behind. Do you foresee them being the factory? Do they, you foresee them to develop by being the factory of the world or anything like that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, uh, no two countries are going to develop in the exact same way, but whenever people raise that kind of question, I think back about this famous article published uh, in 1982 by this uh, the American economist uh, the called uh, William Klein. And he argued that these uh, four little tigers of East Asia, you know, the Korea, Taiwan, uh, Hong Kong, Singapore, they have uh, the developed on the basis of uh, the, uh, uh, tapping the Western market through the, the, the export capability, but uh, he argued that recommending that this policy it, uh, to other countries is uh, committing what the philosophers call the fallacy of composition. Yeah? Because he said, uh, yeah, these four little countries could do it but already there is uh, significant uh, resistance uh, to imports from these countries in the Western markets. You cannot uh, uh, replicate this. Yeah? To slap him in the face, China, which has uh, something like 20 times uh, that of uh, the, the combined uh, population of these four countries, have had a huge success in the export. Yeah? Market is there. Market was there. Yeah. Yes. So the, there will be the, the markets, including China itself, yeah, because it's uh, the, now becoming richer, wages are rising, so the, it will the, the start importing uh, labor-intensive products. Yeah. You know, the, the more and more countries are the, the, the joining this, but the, the, if this uh, export grows, that the grows their market, they also import more. Yeah? Yeah, so I'm not saying that, 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 that all countries can do it, but this idea that uh, somehow the size of the world market is fixed and uh, the African countries uh, cannot do it, I don't believe it. Yeah? So what the, the, these countries need, of course, is not to just repeat that, that what the, the China or the, the Korea or the Taiwan did, but you know, some countries have uh, already made uh, significant progress uh, there. You know, Ethiopia. I mean, of course, that uh, is in a terrible state uh, these days because of uh, the political implosion. But between like uh, the, uh, the 1995 and uh, 2015, Ethiopia grew even faster than China, yeah? and this was at uh, China's super growth period. Yeah? And one important uh, part of that growth was that Ethiopian government went out to China, went out to Korea, and attracted these uh, labor-intensive uh, manufacturers to come and make shoes and clothing and uh, the, you know, the, uh, medical coverings and uh, stuff like that. Yeah? So there is already one country that has uh, that, that made huge progress thanks to those things. Once again, that doesn't mean that other countries can repeat that, but is there something else that, that, that you 
I don't know, as uh, Congo or the, the, you know, the Ghana can do. I'm sure there are. Yeah? lecture you seem to be particularly suspicious about Maru's determinants. That includes geographical determinism and also technological determinants. Mm -hmm. um, and you did an excellent job in identifying the conceptual biases when thinkers draw conclusions on a set of facts that usually are in their faith. Uh, and my question is, when it comes to your own writing, your own analysis, what kinds of facts you will usually prefer to look at? Because you're so cautious about the idea of inevitability, will you place the analysis of historic contingency a higher priority in your research? Yeah, I mean, it's not a perennial dilemma for social scientists, you know, because uh, the, on the one hand, uh, you shouldn't uh, subscribe to, uh, well, what I call the Disney view of the world, you know, if you believed in yourself and work hard enough, you can achieve anything. Yeah? No, it doesn't happen. Yeah? On the other hand, uh, you have uh, other people who overemphasize the importance of uh, structure. Yeah? So, you know, Korea was destined to develop because uh, it had, you know, the, thanks to the American intervention, land reform, you know, it was a uh, you know, client uh, state of uh, the, the, the U.S. Uh, during the Cold War, and yeah, it had uh, the super duper bureaucracy that uh, was uh, inherited uh, from history. But you know, that kind of structure really wasn't there in the same way that uh, people think there was. Yeah. But uh, secondly, even with the same structure, different people do different things, yeah? Human agency matters, yeah? So first of all, the, the, the people think that the South Korea had the, some uh, super duper the bureaucracy, that's why they could do, you know, the development planning and industrial policy well. You know, let me tell you, I mean, until the late 1960s, the World Bank was giving money to South Korean government to send these government officials to countries like the Philippines and Pakistan for training. You may that, that be surprised, but uh, you know the Philippines at the time was the second richest country in Asia after Japan. Pakistan was the golden boy of uh, the World Bank because it was uh, doing a lot of things that World Bank was uh, telling them to do, yeah, and had lots of uh, the, the highly educated economists that uh, who studied in Oxford and Cambridge, yeah. So. Sometimes uh, this uh, description is ex post justification, yeah? but more importantly, with the same structure, different people do different things. Yeah? We had all those conditions in the 1950s, yeah? but the, 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 the country was, uh, the, of course, uh, it was devastated uh, by the Korean War, but the, the, even considering that, the country was doing awfully. Yeah? Americans are pouring money the, in terms of uh, the military aid yeah? and other forms of foreign aid. Uh, in the 1950s, although the, this uh, aid uh, actually fell to the developing country average uh, the, the, in the, the, from the 60s, so the, the, there's uh, another the kind of over description of uh, reality. But you know, so much so that at the end of the 1960s, there was this famous internal memo in the U.S. government aid agency called USAID which uh, describes South Korea as a bottomless pit. Yeah. Why did it happen? Because we had basically our Marie Antoinette as uh, the president. Yeah. I mean, our the, the first uh, president of uh, the Republic of uh, the Korea was a member of a minor branch of a uh, former royal family. He went to stand at uh, Princeton as an undergraduate student in the like 1870s or whatever, when 99.9% uh, .9 of Koreans haven't heard of the place, he married uh, an aristocratic Austrian lady to qualify himself uh, for being called uh, Marie Antoinette, yeah, who was uh, from Austria. You know, a famous anecdote says that when the, the one ta one day his agriculture minister told him that, uh, sir, we have a terrible rice shortage, people are starving. What should I do? 
He said, that's the problem with the bloody Koreans. All they want to eat, eat is rice, yeah? Why don't they eat beef? Yeah, why don't they eat uh, wheat, yeah? I mean, the agricultural minister was uh, too scared uh, to tell him that we don't produce those things, sir. Yeah? In contrast, uh, the, the, our military dictator, General Park, who was a really nasty man, but he cared about the, the, the common people, yeah? He's uh, the, the guy who engineered our economic miracle, yeah? I mean, not single-handedly, but that, yeah, he was a communist when he was young, yeah? mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, I mean, uh, he had uh, that uh, outlook. And this this uh, famous passage in his uh, autobiography, which said, as a young officer in the Japanese Imperial Army, I was uh, uh, traveling on a train. In front of me was uh, sitting this uh, the beautiful the young high school girl uh, who was uh, reading a book of uh, French poetry. Yeah? And her hands were like jade, yeah? And he goes, I hated those hands, yeah? These are the hands of people who ruined our country, yeah? Sitting on their land, doing nothing, reading French poetry, no wonder we got uh, colonized by the Japanese, yeah? Yeah, so when you have uh, that, uh, these two completely different presidents, you are going to have different out uh, outcomes, yeah? So it's a difficult balance to strike, you know, that uh, if you emphasize uh, agency, human agency too much, then uh, you run the danger of uh, that uh, uh, kind of uh, that, uh, being a subscriber of uh, that, uh, that the view that uh, history is uh, that, uh, created by heroes. Yeah? If you emphasize, however, the, the structure too much, then you bec become a fatalist. Yeah? What's the point of uh, doing anything? You know, I mean, this uh, famous uh, the paper by Asenoglu and so on, uh, published in the American Economic Review, 2001. They are basically arguing that uh, the fate of countries were already set 500 years ago. Yeah? If you had uh, too much uh, the tropical disease and white people died uh, the too much, they didn't bring you good institutions. Yeah? If uh, the weather was uh, the more hospitable, they wanted to settle down, they brought uh, good institutions. Yeah? And this is what uh, that, uh, determines the quality of institutions uh, that today. And this is the, the quality of institution uh, is uh, what determines their, their economic performance. Yeah, yeah if uh, that's the, uh, the, the conclusion, what's the point? Yeah? Unless you invent a time machine yeah? and bring malaria drugs uh, that, uh, back to the, the 16th century, nothing's going to change. Yeah? So, you know, in between these two, you know, it will all take different positions. You know, some people will emphasize agency more than the structure, others will uh, do the opposite, uh, but, you know, you, you have to uh, look at both, yeah? Okay, we'll have one last quick question, um, and the gentleman in the back. No, that's you, yeah. <laughs> um, I have a question about Sorry, can you speak up a bit? I have a question about automation yeah. and job losses. Mm -hmm. I, I probably agree with your sentiment that the fears surrounding like a massive job loss because of automation is probably overblown. But um, admittedly, I don't have anything I can offer to people who are afraid of job losses apart from just appealing to the fact that in the past, Automation always happened, and there was always some sort of a job recovery. So, is there any like solid mechanism we can rely on to to know that future technological mm -hmm. change won't create like a catastrophic crisis? And also, um, about your point about technological change now not being especially fast relative to the past. Um, is there any um, empirical evidence that you can point us to um, that support that if technological change can be quantified in the first place? Yeah, well, on the second one, you know, I do not exactly work in this area, so that, uh, I cannot that, uh, tell you whether there is a uh, good reference, but my guess is that uh, people haven't really tried to kind of create really comprehensive uh, index of uh, technological progress. So, 
I mean, the, our knowledge is uh, very incomplete uh, there. Uh, but on the first one, yes, I mean, the, I, I briefly mentioned it, and yeah, I'm sorry I didn't explain it that, uh, well enough, but you know, there are lots of things that uh, we can do and have been doing. Yeah? I mean, first of all, the welfare state is uh, the, the basically a collective insurance for workers. Yeah? Because that, uh, I mean, if you have an open economy, yeah, you don't know who's going to be the next victim of export the, the competition, yeah? who's going to be the next uh, victim of uh, technological progress. Yeah? So you collectively agree to create this mechanism that, uh, that you will not die even if you yeah, uh, are unlucky enough to be a victim of these uh, changes. Yeah? And yeah, indeed, uh, that, uh, you uh, the look at uh, countries like uh, uh, Sweden and Finland, the, the, which have a very strong welfare state, but also what they call the active labor market policy which means that uh, the government is not only going to give you income support uh, during your unemployment, but uh, it will actively retrain you and uh, 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 give you a kind of job search coach yeah? and uh, even like uh, lend you a bridging loan if you have to move uh, to another city for a new job. Yeah? So that uh, when you have that kind of policy, workers become less afraid of uh, the, those uh, changes, yeah? and this is why, despite having like eighty percent of workers unionized, these countries have uh, the, the much fewer strikes than the countries like uh, the U.S., where only about ten percent of the workers uh, are unionized. Yeah, because in the U.S., uh, if you lose your job, you cannot even go to a hospital. Yeah, yeah. I would uh, fight like hell that uh, if uh, I was a uh, U.S. worker. Yeah? Whereas in the Sweden, Finland, yeah, who likes to lose their current job, but you know, it's not the end of the world. You can get kind of uh, changes according to the particular government in power, but uh, basically between 60 and 70 percent of your last wage for up to two years yeah, in those countries that, uh, while you are finding a new job. Yeah, and there will be subsidized uh, government retraining, Companies will also uh, try to uh, uh, retrain their workers yeah? uh, when they are trying to introduce uh, the major technological change. So, you know, it's a random example, but on YouTube I saw this uh, the little video about uh, this uh, nickel mine that, uh, in the far north of uh, Sweden where they are robotizing uh, the mining. Yeah? And they are training the workers, uh, sorry, miners, as uh, robot engineers. Yeah? maintaining the robots, uh, fixing the robots. Yeah, and this uh, program interviewed uh, these uh, miners and they said, yeah, I mean, uh, we have no problem because uh, it's not as if you know, these uh, machines are going to come and uh, kick us out. We'll have just different jobs and actually better jobs because we don't have to go out that, 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 and when, when it's at, uh, 40 degrees outside and uh, go into the underground that, that workplace. Yeah? So, you can do this, yeah. Countries have done this, uh, companies have done this, yeah. Once again, I mean, that it's only because you don't want to do this that uh, you tell people, oh, there's no other way, yeah. So. Okay, thank you so much once again for coming. And uh, we'd also like to thank the Cambridge Union for hosting us as well. And before all of you leave, uh, we have a quick uh, a little surprise uh, for some of you guys. If you look under your chair, if there happens to be a little um, blue, blue. Uh, blue chip, oh. uh, you will get one of the books uh -huh. that are here um, and signed by wow. Professor Hunter Chung. So they should be. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, if, you, if you have one, please come here uh, after the talk. And also, can we have another round of applause for Professor Hadi Chung?
Okay, so okay, thank you so uh, much for coming. But how